210 here. All right. <clears throat> so let's see, I have the floor for the entirety of the class today. Um, and um, <clears throat> the way, um, since this is the, the technical part of this lecture is supposed to be to develop general familiarity with the science behind uh, um, the uh, uh, sort of nuclear power and nuclear weapons, fuel cycle and so forth. And um, <clears throat> to give you um, a little facility with doing uh, simple numbers, which are useful, um, the, um, uh, the, the key thing to keep in mind is uh, you don't need necessarily to uh, be able to reproduce uh, or to understand uh, everything in numerical detail that I do. Um, the, uh, because this is something is, of course, it's supposed to be uh, accessible both to the people on the technical side and the policy side, but to get the kind of the general dance of how the whole thing goes. Um, I'm also mindful of the fact that even the people in our own department, in nuclear engineering, um, uh, particularly the undergraduates, uh, I'm not quite sure where Lee Bernstein is with the um, NE 101 course, and uh, we may be um, making forays into topics which are actually ahead of where he is. So I'm, I'm mindful of, of that. So, um, and therefore I'm uh, uh, like to um, I'm drag my feet a little bit. And also the best way to, to, for education delivery is to give things in a kind of a layered way such that each class, I go back a few slides and reprise what we've done before to help um, solidify and consolidate for you um, the th topics we've just talked about. Um, so what we're now going to do is sort of finish up where we were last time with nuclear reactions and then get into some concepts um, by the end of this, uh, to the, uh, this lecture, we should uh, probably finish up um, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the thing of uh, some, some um, basic notions of criticality, chain reactions, uh, so to speak, and, um, and then go a little bit further into um, uh, the um, phenomena of chain reactions and add a few other aspects of the science that, were, that are interesting or important for you to know about when we talk about nuclear weapons. So we're kind of still at the part of the course where we're kind of setting the table uh, with basic notions uh, so we can get into more technical stuff a little bit later on. Okay, let's see, um, my forward button. Okay, we did fission. Um, we understand the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the science behind what of the very large energy release per uh, fission event, which is that you're gaining approximately one MeV per nucleon in binding energy from 240 approximately uh, nucleons, uh, which is where you get a 200 um, and something MeV in energy. Largely comes out in fission fragments. Key thing is, um, and this was a large dream, is that one gets um, between two and three neutrons, depending on the fissioning uh, species and the uh, energy uh, uh, the, um, uh, of the uh, event, it's a kind of a Poisson process. Uh, one gets out um, more neutrons out than, than neutrons in, which um, holds, then holds out the possibility of there being either a controlled or an uncontrolled uh, reaction uh, or chain reaction. Um, and okay, so now we got into the issue of uh, reactions last time. Um, <clears throat> uh, typically, uh, A plus B going to C plus D. You are now, uh, it's old hat to you how to calculate using the, the National Nuclear Data Table, the interactive uh, website, how to calculate uh, the Q value, whether the thing is endothermic or exothermic, whether it takes energy to make the reaction go or it releases energy. 
Um, the um, um, classical example, which will be relevant to us later on, is the fusion of deuterium and tritium um, to give an alpha particle and a neutron with a release of nearly 18 MeV, most of that coming out, 14 MeV coming out in uh, the, uh, the kinetic energy of the neutron. Um, <clears throat> lots of different types of, of nuclear reactions. Um, and as um, um, uh, you uh, saw last time, you have neutron-induced reactions, which can occur at uh, arbitrarily low energies uh, because there is no Coulomb barrier there. There's no Coulomb repulsion between the projectile and the target, which is why uh, fission went like gangbusters um, right from the, uh, the late 30s into the 40s. One immediately was able to build reactors, weaponize it, make compact reactors for submarines and so forth, all in the space of, of um, you know, 15 years. One had a, a, a absolute, um, uh, uh, this was a, a real um, disruptive technology. It really changed the course of history, uh, nuclear fission. Um, fusion, although it looks like a very simple, clean, very exothermic reaction does not go well, <laughs> generally, um, because this is, uh, you're dealing with two charged particles in the entrance uh, channel and, uh, and uh, which have a Coulomb repulsion. And it takes a certain average energy to get them close enough before the nuclear force takes over and you can, you can have a reaction. Um, you can have reactions induced by photons and break up reactions uh, and so forth. Um, uh, the only few ground rules, you have to conserve charge, total nucleon number, sum of protons and neutrons, and of course, um, one uh, uh, total energy. Okay. Oop. Okay. Um, we, let's see, actually did this in my, uh, the next slide, but um, we actually developed the notion of a cross-section, uh, which has units of area. And the idea um, being that the way uh, experimental physicists measure cross-sections, the, uh, the simplest way of measuring a total cross-section uh, is what's called a transmission experiment, where you have a certain flux of particles in, you measure the flux of particles, uh, the beam particles, which are undeflected going out. And uh, for a known thickness, i.e. a known number of uh, scatterers um, uh, in there, and um, one can derive the physics quantity of interest, which we denote as small sigma, you know, measured in centimeters squared, with um, the what I call the aerial density. This is my own kind of nomenclature to uh, distinguish it from um, uh, mass density. I put the little uh, hash sign below number density, which is the number of scatters per square centimeter uh, like here. So the scatters, uh, the, number, the number of particles which scatter, get scattered out of the beam, removed from the beam, is the number in um, times uh, the uh, number density, the volumetric number density times the thickness, this gives an aerial density per square centimeter. And the physics quantity is, is in, in centimeters squared. The product of these, of course, is a pure number uh, and is a fraction, um, a, a very small uh, fraction in a well-designed experiment where the, the, uh, the target is thin. Um, the um, the uh, basic unit, uh, convenient unit, is often uh, used as, as a barn, um, 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. And um, it is what you would quote unquote expect for uh, nuclear reactions, given what we said earlier, uh, that the strong force is very, very short ranged. Uh, in other words, uh, nuclei, uh, nucleons only um, can interact if they are within a, um, a fermi of one another. Uh, typical nuclear radii are a few fermis. Uh, for calcium, it might be 2.4 fermi radius. For lead, it might be closer to uh, uranium, six or seven fermis like that. And you, your most naive assumption for the um, 
uh, you know, for a cross section, if I shoot a proton or a neutron at a, uh, a target, <clears throat> would be the aerial density that the, that the nucleus presents to you. So if you say if the diameter is, uh, let's say, uh, about 10 uh, fermis, um, and um, <clears throat> that, so that would be uh, 10 to the minus 12 uh, centimeters, um, then the aerial uh, cross-section would be that number squared approximately, or 10 to the minus 24. So that's why 10 to the minus 24 was picked as kind of the, the yard, yardstick or, the, uh, or a convenient uh, unit to discuss uh, cross sections. Now, I'm actually, we're going to go back and I, I love showing YouTube uh, videos in this class. I actually want to go back and show that again to, to reinforce the uh, lesson from last time to make sure this kind of sinks in. Um, there's a very big, this is, and this is critical to the class, very big difference in the phenomenology of fast neutrons and slow neutrons. Fast neutrons, um, the, um, the um, uh, uh, in fact, seem to obey the common sense expectation that a cross section ought to be the quote unquote physical size of, of a nucleus, the, 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 the geometric uh, uh, density um, or the aerial density uh, geometrically. Um, once I thermalize um, neutrons, um, and I uh, allow them to uh, scatter and lose energy. Um, and then when they get down to what is called the uh, thermal regime, um, and um, which means that they actually come into equilibrium with the random uh, thermal motion of uh, molecules or atoms in a medium at room temperature, roughly 300 Kelvin, um, that turns out you can work out, you know enough now to work that out, that in EV that turns out to be about 1 40th of an electron volt, 0 0.025. These cross sections often, not always, often are much, much bigger by two to three orders of magnitude, hundreds or thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even a few cases, a million barns like this. Um, not a key thing for us to understand why that's the case, but simply to be aware of that. And uh, because this actually is one of the drivers behind uh, why reactors are designed as they are. Um, okay, uh, just a little table uh, here <clears throat> showing the um, uh, thermal absorption cross sections, i.e. for a neutron to be absorbed uh, and cause a reaction uh, there in uh, uh, light, whoopsie daisy, light nuclei, um, they are uh, very small one, but then one can find uh, in the case of your actinides, these can be like plutonium-239, uranium-238 on the order of a thousand barns. And then you find um, uh, certain uh, isotopes uh, which have a voracious appetite for gobbling up neutrons and taking them out of play case of xenon here, 2.7 million. Cadmium, I think, is on the order of a million, maybe 800,000 barns or something like that. Boron 10 is a very good neutron absorber as well, uh, like that. And these things are used, um, well, they're kind of a two-edged sword. Um, xenon, of course, are, uh, gets uh, builds up as a, uh, and other things get uh, build up as a, in reactors over a course of years, uh, or over the course of months as you burn through the fuel, um, as a fission product, and it sticks uh, in the fuel there, it is known as a, in the, in the, uh, in the business, as a poison, because uh, you create the stuff, and then it ends up eating neutrons and taking them out of play, um, uh, which means you have to take other measures to um, keep the, uh, the reactor operating at a fixed uh, power level. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you use boron actually as active control rods in some reactors um, to keep uh, the neutron uh, uh, the uh, the uh, neutron multiplication factor um, uh, the criticality of it exactly uh, even uh, you know uh, with the uh, uh, you know running at a at an even power level all, all the time. Okay, this was actually quite good. I did not know that this. Uh, is a uh, 
person known to Jake. But uh, let's look at this one more time, and then and then we'll we'll move on. Um, it was pretty good. These pieces of plastic surround a slow neutron detector uh, that consists of helium-3 gas in a proportional tube. And this electronics over here is uh, counting the uh, uh, response of that tube to neutrons. Here we see the uh, meter is showing about 50 neutrons per second or about halfway up the scale. As I've noted the uh, previous video, uh, the neutron source in use here is a fast neutron source uh, comprised of americium in close contact with beryllium. And it releases neutrons with a mean energy of about 4 MeV. Uh, on contrast, or with, uh, in contrast to that, the uh, detector tube mostly detects slow neutrons that have been moderated in the plastic and reflected back into the tube. So let me stop right here and just make a comment. Um, we'll see this in, in uh, about 15 minutes or so. Um, he uses the word moderation. Um, the, uh, what is special about um, the uh, polyethylene here, he could have used uh, a volume of water or other things, like that, is that it's hydrogenous. It's very rich in um, hydrogen, which is basically a proton. Um, as you know, playing billiards or this little, uh, uh, you know, a coffee table toy that you have of these little strings holding these shiny steel balls, um, the ideal moderator, if you want to most efficiently um, take a fast object by a sequence of, of scatters to slow it down as efficiently as possible, you want the mass of the object it is scattering to be equal in mass. If I shoot a very uh, a light object on a heavy object, like a, uh, um, a BB onto a bowling ball, it will bounce back uh, or at any angles with essentially the same kinetic energy that it came in with. So it's, that's, that would be a very poor moderator. If I, uh, alternatively, if I have a large uh, projectile coming in and a uh, small scatterer, uh, the scatterer will actually end up going backwards uh, at the uh, twice the velocity of the of the of the particle coming in, but it's so, so it's so light it takes away very little kinetic energy. Ideal situation is um, for neutrons, is, since protons and neutrons are essentially the same mass, is to use hydrogenous materials, water, polyethylene, and so forth. So the fast neutron. Um, uh, will uh, rattle around, make a number of collisions, and then get down into the energy region where, in fact, the the uh, uh, the tube uh, will be sensitive uh, uh, to to uh, detect uh, the neutron. A very good homework problem that Jake may assign you sometime in the future is to ask. Uh, it's a very simple thing you can do in your calculator. Um, uh, how many scatters does it take to go from uh, uh, about an MeV, a fast neutron, down to thermal energies. You can make a very realistic, a very decent assumption that every scatter um, uh, it, it will take away about half the energy. Some of them will be head on, some of them will be more glancing. On the average, it'll take away half the energy. It turns out it's a very small number, about 25 scatters, and you've gone from fast down to thermal. Okay. Now we're gonna place a piece of cadmium, which is a very strong absorber of slow neutrons around the proportional counter. And we will see how that impacts the count rate. So first I'll take this piece of plastic out and then I will temporarily remove the fast neutron source, if the tape will allow me. And we'll place the cadmium sleeve onto the tube. And I will replace the neutron source. And the piece of plastic. Now let's take a look at our count rate. 
it's taken a serious hit from the cadmium attenuation. It used to be up there halfway up the scale at 50 per second. Now it's barely at 10 per second. So more than three quarters of our uh, neutron flux, uh, our low energy neutron flux that had been making it into the tube is now being eaten up by the cadmium. Let's try a somewhat different experiment. I'm going to take the cadmium sleeve off the tube. And in this experiment, I'm going to place the neutron source into a cadmium sleeve. Like that. Now I'll place the cadmium covered source onto the tube and I'll replace the piece of plastic. And we will see what this has done to our neutron count rate. We used to be halfway up the scale, almost uh, 50 counts per second uh, before beginning this experiment. Now uh, we're almost uh, at 40 counts per second or almost uh, only one fifth of where we were when uh, we had no cadmium whatsoever in here. So in contrast to the previous experiment where the cadmium sleeve covered the tube and attenuated uh, four fifths of our neutron flux getting into the tube, now we are uh, putting the cadmium around the fast neutron source and the neutrons uh, at the high energies have no trouble getting through the cadmium. They're being moderated and reflected back into the detector by the surrounding plastic. These pieces of plastic surround a slow neutron. Okay, now after the first variation of his, um, it would be reasonable if you did not know any nuclear physics um, you, it, it would be reasonable to not know whether the cadmium, um, uh, you know, what was going on there. But I, when the, the, those two, pro, those two experiments in sequence uh, make clear that what is happening is um, that uh, the uh, in the case where he puts the source inside the cadmium sleeve, the Fast neutrons are not getting intercepted on the way out. Uh, they, but once they thermalize and become slow, um, they are not able to get. They uh, uh, they can then get into the tube. In the case when he puts the cadmium on the tube, the fast neutrons scatter, thermalize, but then can't get into the tube. So what's going on? Um, and I forget whether we showed this last time. This is what's called a differential and energy differential cross section. Um, of um, uh, in on a log scale. So you, we're going here uh, from 10 MeV, 10 to the seventh, um, 10 to the six is one EV, uh, 100 kilovolts and so forth. Uh, there is one electron volt and thermal energies uh, are uh, 1 40th uh, of an electron volt are about right here where my cursor is like that. And here you can see that the cross section is um, quote unquote geometrical. It's, it's a few barns. Um, and then it rises up precipitously and keeps on rising up at the, the very lowest energies going up to a million barns. And, uh, and, and uh, since this is a log plot, you don't, can't see this, but in fact, it just keeps going up uh, like one over the velocity uh, forever as, as slow neutron cross sections do. Whoops. Now, question um, that we have to get into. What is this forest right here? Um, this is what's measured. It doesn't just stop right here. It keeps on going down. But this is what has been reported uh, and archived um, in, the, um, in the data libraries. Um, these are resonances. Okay. Um, now, remember, um, if I were to take uh, cadmium 114 
which is uh, cadmium-113 having captured a neutron, you could say, how much energy does it take to take a neutron out of cadmium-114 at rest, you know, at a large distance from the, uh, the cadmium-13 daughter? Um, like everything else in the world, it's some number like six or eight MeV. That's a very standard what's called a separation energy for the neutron. Um, now, play the film backwards. If I take in a, a zero energy, a negligible energy, just an energy, a neutron coming in with essentially zero energy, when it is captured by cadmium-113, uh, it becomes cadmium-114, at that moment, it is at a, uh, it is at a excitation energy of something like six or eight MeV, very typical. That is very high up in excitation energy. Um, as you've seen, we've showed some level density uh, diagrams before, uh, low in energy, the levels are, are far apart and, 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 and sparse. As you go up and up and up, just like in atomic levels, the level densities gets uh, more and more and more dense. So these here, these sharp spikes, are in fact um, uh, resonances which the neutrons with the neutron captures onto. Uh, they are at discrete energies. If I were to take this and expand the scale out, I would actually see uh, flat places and then sharp sp uh, spikes and so forth. Um, you may say, well, what on earth is a resonance? Um, you can think a little bit about um, a, a crystal wine glass and I can take a uh, audio frequency synthesizer or an opera singer um, and then sweep the tone and you will find that uh, at least in the case of a uh, wine glass there'll be one dominant frequency where um, you can drive uh, a resonance there's a sympathetic uh, uh, a oscillation there that we call a resonance um, and the same thing here the um, there are discrete states um, uh, in the uh, system cadmium-114 um, uh, that, um, you know, uh, where you're going to have a very enhanced absorption of that neutron. This is important. Now you could say, uh, do, does it really stop here? And the answer is no, this is, uh, this here is uh, a resonance just like that guy or that guy or that guy. You say, well, it looks different, it looks broader, but remember this is a diff this is a logarithmic scale. So uh, in fact, if I were to plot this on a linear scale, um, this th th would have a width that would, you would not imagine to be terribly different from any of these other ones up here. Okay, and as you go higher in energy, uh, they get more and more dense. Um, now, let me come back to this point. As I say, the, my, the, the point of this course is not to teach you physics, but just to give you um, a toolkit. But you might say, well, what is what what, what on earth is going on? Uh, why is it that I you you Van Bibber you told me that the nuclear force is short ranged? Uh, why is it that I can get these cross sections, which are much much bigger than kind of the pie plate geometrical value? Uh, I think an important uh, clue here uh, back in 2000 and uh, 1915 or so, Prince Louis de Broglie. Uh, in, uh, in um, uh, I think he was in Zurich at the time, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, well, I think it was in France, I think at the time, he was, uh, um, uh, wrote a PhD thesis um, that was, uh, eat your heart out, your, your grad students, it was one page long. In his PhD thesis, he hypothesized that just like photons, um, that particles um, had a wavelength and their wavelength was inverse to their momentum. Now, it was old hat. I mean, the fact that, uh, that, that, um, that light could be, uh, that was, was wavelength, was uh, wave-like, was old hat. I mean, that was even the French physicist of a century earlier could show, you know, uh, diffraction phenomena um, uh, and, um, uh, and interference phenomena due to light. So the, the fact that light was uh, somehow a wave phenomenon uh, was uh, old hat. This was quite radical. This was in the precursor to the real quantum mechanics. 
Um, and um, the uh, it really came full bloom, fully formalized in 1925, but we had the Bohr theory and so forth. And then uh, de, de Broglie came up with this um, astonishing uh, uh, hypothesis that uh, particles as well as uh, light could behave in a wavelength manner and that the wavelength was inverse to the momentum. His thesis committee wa wa was so flabbergasted by this, they didn't know what to do of his one page thesis that they actually wrote a letter to Einstein. I think Einstein was in Zurich at the time and, and, and Einstein, broad man, minded fellow, read the thesis they asked him, what should we do with this guy? And he wrote him back a letter and said, give him his degree. <laughs> and he was right. And in 1927, Davison and Germer actually were able to do scattering experiments of electrons from nickel crystals and actually show that particles uh, uh, had a wavelength um, exactly in accord with de Broglie's uh, hypothesis. Um, so it's Planck's constant, uh, which I think you're all familiar with, at least from the SEM side. Uh, you've seen it one time or another in a modern physics course, or whatever, divided by the momentum. As I said, don't drag around in your brain um, terrible units with numbers like 10 to the minus umpty ump in there. Um, there are a convenient toolkit of constants that you should always remember and just have on the tip of your tongue. Uh, this one you can even round up to the number 200. So. Um, h bar, h over Planck's constant divided by two pi times the speed of light, which everyone remembers, is about 200 MeV Fermis. Um, and so you can now calculate to say that a fast neutron, here's a 10 MeV neutron, has a wavelength on the order of Fermis. A thermal neutron has a de Broglie wavelength, uh, which is the size of an atom. And in fact, um, physicists, you know, play around with what are called ultra cold neutrons, where they they cool neutrons down to liquid helium temperatures. Those things have um, uh, wavelengths which are microns uh, in, uh, in, uh, in size. And uh, once that happens, then these things actually can specularly reflect off metallic surfaces, just like lights uh, bouncing off a mirror. And you can actually guide these things, control them, move them hither and yon, trap them and whatever simply because the wavelength is now uh, thousands of atomic spacings uh, wide and you actually get specular ref ref reflection there. This is a little bit of the flavor of what's going on and why you can have these absurd uh, large cross sections. Okay, let's bring this into fission. So here are um, the fission cross sections. Um, uh, again, from uh, is, this is uh, the uh, uh, OECD uh, publication here. Um, again, log plot here, um, and uh, here you've got both 235 and 239, and um, 238 here, which is, uh, uh, in, in fact, is a uh, fertile but not fizzle uh, uh, nucleus. And uh, this shows the difference between 238 and 235. Here you have for very fast neutrons, if a very fast neutron smacks into a uranium-238, well, it's got a decent enough cross-section uh, once you get up to many MeV. But once you even get down to an MeV, it just plummets like a rock and the thing does not fission. 235 and <coughs> 239 here, um, track one another, they actually still have uh, several barn cross section at MeV and keep on rising. Um, here you get down into uh, the resonance region here. Um, there, uh, in fact, this is an MeV. So at uh, 10 to the minus uh, eight down here, MeV is about 10 to the minus two electron volt is the thermal region. You see the resonance region, the last resonance uh, like this, and then you know the neutron separation threshold, of course, is it uh, on this plot would be zero. And the cross section for both species for thermal is on the order of a thousand barns. Okay. Now, the other thing to pay attention to on this graph is this shaded blue region. You see it's most intense at around MeV 
and kind of trails off to lower energies and trails off to higher energies. This is the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, roughly what's called a uh, watt spectrum. It's kind of a quasi thermal spectrum of, uh, of neutrons uh, from a typical of fissioning species like this. In fact, you can see neutrons that go out to 10 to 20 MeV and it turns over and you can see uh, neutrons that are uh, lower as well. But on the average, you're going to see neutrons coming out with of order uh, MeV. Now, um, I can uh, slice and dice this a little bit more. We talked about total cross-section, um, but um, you can say, well, what happened? Okay, so there was something happened. It scattered or it, it cap or was captured, uh, but so you can actually then take and dissect the cross-section um, into what are called partial cross-sections. Um, there's elastic scattering, neutron in, neutron out, um, and leaving the thing in the ground state. I can have an inelastic scattering. We saw this before we, in the case we talked about uh, a neutron hitting a carbon-12 nucleus, popping it up to the, four, the first excited 4.43 MeV state, and then leaving with less energy. Uh, so the, the, the carbon and the neutron have 4.43 MeV less energy because part of the energy is now internal excitation of the, of the carbon. I can capture that neutron uh, and then it, uh, it will gamma decay down to, by one or more gammas down to the ground state. It can fission and so forth. Okay. Um, I can also, I didn't, it's not important for our discussion today, uh, the other way of slicing and dicing the total cross-section is you can talk about an energy differential, d sigma dE. What we saw before were um, energy differential cross-sections. Um, there are what are called angular differential uh, cross-section, d sigma d omega. The prob you can ask say, what is the millibarns per unit steradian at 30 degrees or something like that? no importance to this particular class right now. But um, the fact that you have um, um, that there are different histories, possible histories for the neutron uh, is important and, if, and the energy differential cross sections are important. Okay, um, what I'm going to do now is switch to my next slide deck here. And now we'll begin to um, get into a little bit more detail. Um, the a little more detail with um, the um, uh, uh, the concepts we've talked about uh, in the context of a chain reaction. Okay, here we go. Okay, these things we talked about before, so we don't do this again. Now, um, you've seen an exponential curve once before. Um, you've seen an exponential curve um, uh, when you have a, uh, a radioactive species or an excited species, um, and um, you, uh, you start with a million or you start with a billion of these things, and then ask um, uh, a year later, how many do I have left? Two years later, how many do I have left? Uh, three years later, how, uh, how many do I have left? Um, Any time I have a process, a decay process, where um, uh, the probability at any given time um, for a thing to decay or not decay is the same, i.e. It, it has, and, and in physics, these things uh, almost never have a, uh, you know, are, are history dependent, um, then you have a Poisson process and you, you actually find that you, you solve the equation, you get a very simple exponential decay, um, uh, a decay curve. You see a similar thing if I take um, a thin target, um, I shoot in a large number of particles, um, uh, here in this schematic example, I shoot in a thousand particles. 
uh, I, th this lab will, will scatter out 20% of them, 800 are left. Um, um, uh, but these are undeflected of the same energy. It goes to another identical slab. Uh, 0.8 times 0.8 is uh, 0.64, 640, uh, and so forth and so forth like that. Um, what you will find then, if I take a thick slab and interrogate as a function of distance in the slab, um, how many do I have left? It also, for the same reason, um, uh, the... Um, you know, will undergo, uh, you'll see this exponential uh, uh, decay here of number versus thickness in the attenuator. And um, uh, generally this is uh, typically written as, uh, as I did back here, can't play with the mouse at the same time. Um, um, the initial number uh, times e to the minus mu x, where mu is called the attenuation coefficient. So um, that tells you how many are going to be left. Now, obviously, that begs the question, OK, we know it's going to decay exponentially uh, with uh, thickness. Um, what is the, uh, <clears throat> the mean, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the coefficient of attenuation? Um, or put differently, one over that, what we call the mean free path, one over mu. That is, uh, as before, is um, uh, a product of the density uh, here, the number of potential scatters per cubic centimeter times the cross section, okay? So when this, uh, the uh, slab is thick enough um, that this thing is the number um, uh, where uh, this, uh, you know, where, where e to the minus mu times the thickness uh, brings you down by one over e, that is called the mean free path lambda or one over mu. So it all goes back again to this fundamental thing, the cross section. Okay, we've done this before, we'll come back to it later. Okay. Um, um, just a sort of a toy picture of a uh, water reactor, not to talk about specific um, reactors, although I think someday I may have Max Fertoni or somebody come in and give us a little taxonomy, since we are, this course is interest itself in proliferation and, uh, uh, and uh, of course, the uh, type of reactor and their power levels and the, the fuel they use and what one does with the fuel afterwards, of course, is, you know, all about what nonproliferation is as a field. Um, this is just simply a, uh, a toy schematic of, 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 of a reactor. And I think this is familiar to all of you. Um, uh, modern reactors basically have um, uh, the fuel confined in, uh, in uh, rods, in discrete elements. Nowadays, they're, uh, they're dealing with new designs of reactors based on, uh, on rather large uh, pebbles. Um, uh, and in a typical light water reactor, commercial reactor, um, uh, these things are uh, enriched, um, but to a low level. Three to 5% is, is very characteristic of commercial uh, enrichment uh, there. So you have most of the fuel in here is 238 uh, with an enriched, um, but not bomb grade, not 90%, 92% to 235, but three to 5% uranium. Um, and of course it's encapsulated and in, uh, in, in uh, cladding here. And water serves a dual purpose, both as a coolant, uh, actually a triple purpose, uh, a, a coolant, a moderator, and of course the, the uh, water uh, of course, this provides the conveyance of the heat to, um, uh, you know, to uh, uh, the uh, uh, to ultimately what one does with this thing thermodynamically, mechanically, to produce electricity. Okay, uh, a neutron comes in. Let's start with a neutron coming in. It it strikes a a, 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 a the uh, two thirty five. It's absorbed. Multiple neutrons are given out. These things will then collide in the, the water. It will scatter around, uh, s effectively slow them down, enter another fuel rod, cause another fission, and so forth. Now, um, this is, of course, a 
over simplification of this um, when you really double click and actually see what's going on, um, the, uh, you actually see that uh, um, there's lots and lots of things that can happen to a neutron. You might say, gee, life is good. I get out two and a half, three neutrons per fission event. Um, so uh, what's not to love? Obviously you can make a uh, reactor uh, uh, work. Um, but um, the uh, it actually uh, it actually takes uh, sufficient you know uh, I mean uh, uh, a uh, design acumen to make a reactor uh, work as desired and uh, to be able to work in a um, a um, a safe and uh, uh, operational regime. In the case of a reactor one wants to have the neutron multiplication factor um, equal to one to a very high degree. That's called critical. Um, if the neutron multiplication factor is less than one, then of course, very quickly, the chain reaction dies out. If it's greater than one, you have a limited time to uh, fix your problem. <laughs> uh, and uh, if it's much greater than one, then uh, then the thing is, is a... Uh, a bomb. Okay, so I mean uh, that you have uh, uh, presumably one is designed for this uh, operational regime in the, in the case of a bomb. Um, okay, so my analogy is that this is a little bit like, uh, although this is an old movie, the life of each neutron in a reactor is like Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, you know, so uh, lots of things can happen to a neutron from the time it's born to when it um, may or may not um, uh, give rise to another fissioning event. So uh, lots of, uh, you know, uh, perilous things happen to a neutron after each, after each event. So let's um, do, uh, again, this is not a course in reactor physics, but let's walk through this very um, uh, slowly just to build up intuition. Let's first of all talk about, and we'll actually show some cartoons and think through this a little bit later on, but let's think about if I had an infinite amount of fuel. So it's infinite in all three um, directions. The, um, the, um, so, uh, and then, be careful with this mouse here. Um, yeah, so what I call K sub infinity, the infinity just means that I'm dealing with with fuel without uh, a boundary. Um, the, the neutron multiplication factor uh, is actually um, the product of, of, <coughs> of four uh, factors. We'll actually talk about finite size uh, assemblies and uh, what's called the, the six factor formula. All right, hold on, I'm gonna get myself a uh, water here. Uh, let me go down to the kitchen here. Um, whoop. Oops. Hold on. All right. Uh, well, uh, well, Carl is 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 is. Is, is dealing with this technical snafu. Uh, Jake and I have, have come uh, to realize that perhaps we should have been a bit more explicit in the homework. If it says NE slash phys on one of the problems, it's for graduate nuclear and physics students. So if you're an undergrad and you're an undergraduate nuclear engineer or physics student, you don't have to do those problems. All good? Everyone? Excited for another round of, of discussion Jeopardy. I worked out the technical the technical kinks, so should be good. Got you guys a buzzer. Yes, your, your silence says it all. What is yes? <laughs> He's got it. I have never been more excited, Aaron, in my life. I appreciate that. We can tell. It's a kind of honesty I 
I've come to know and love. Anytime. All you do is ask. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. I want to express my excitement, but it's very windy here. I'm not sure if you already answered this, but a question in the chat was, for undergrads, can we still do the graduate problems for extra credit? So there's one bonus that's assigned, um, but uh, no, it would it would unbalance the problem set pretty significantly if those were all bonus. Thanks for asking, though. Sounds good. Thank you. You can do them for fun, though. Or become a grad student, and then you have to do them. Easy. Now we're unmuted. Carl, you're muted. Good, I'm COVID, I'm COVID free. I was just got dry here. So let's share again. Um, wow, one year, still can't use this thing. Can you see it? No, no, we cannot. Oh, share. How about now? There yeah. it is. Okay, good. All right. Whew. Aye, aye, aye. All right. Good. Uh, now we're going to move on. Okay. Um, we got here. So, in the case of infinite fuel, um, uh, we'll actually develop the intuition for this right here. Um, we start with a number of um, neutrons. Um, uh, let's start with one neutron after it is emitted. Uh, there is a, um, uh, the number of neutrons emitted per neutron captured in the fuel. Now, before we said, well, you know, uranium was 2.4, plutonium is 2.7 or vice versa like that. Um, it turns out that's the number of neutrons emitted if there is a fission event. But a small fraction of the time, a non-trivial fraction of the time, a neutron can, can capture onto uh, a, a, the nucleus of the fuel and gamma decay, in which case it's out of play. And that number is going to be less. It'll be closer to two. Okay. Um, there's what's now then called the fast fission factor. <clears throat> you saw before that the fission cross-section associated with fast neutrons was a factor of 100 or 1,000 smaller, close to 1,000 smaller than at thermal energies. But it's not trivial. I mean, a certain fraction of these neutrons, fast neutrons, um, uh, will smack into a nucleus, uh, scatter from a nucleus, and cause a fission, in which case you get a few more. Um, so this uh, epsilon is the only bonus in the problem. That is going to be a number that will be something like 1.03 or something like that. Everything else, uh, okay, you start with a certain number of neutrons. Everything else uh, is not your friend, okay? Um, the um, neutrons, as they slow down, let's see if I can go, in, in the resonance region, as the neutron begins, look at my cursor, as the neutron slows down, um, um, the cross-section goes up, but now I'm going through this perilous region where in fact the cross-section can come uh, for capture uh, can become very high. And then generally these things will gamma decay down to the, uh, down to the ground state and not fission. Okay. Um, oh, just a little, um, historical thing. Um, we'll look into server a little bit later on in the course. This is actually a hand-drawn sketch from Robert Serber in the Los Alamos Primer that was used for training the new recruits back in 1942 and onwards. And it's astonishing, even with the primitive ex experiments they had at the time, you know, the, the cyclotrons and the Geiger-Muller counters and so forth, um, their determination of, of the cross-section um, for uranium and, uh, and plutonium was darn close to the, uh, the best values you see in the tables today. So these guys were pretty smart. Okay, so 
the neutron, as it slows down, has to make its way unscathed through the resonance region to get down into the region here where, you, where the cross-section for fission is very, very high. Okay, and then there is the fraction of thermal neutrons captured by the fuel because they can capture on lots of other things. They can capture on the cladding, they can capture on protons. Proton plus the neutron gives a 2.2 MeV gamma ray. All of these things are bad news. They take a neutron out of play and that neutron does not get a chance to cause another fission. So you start with a large number like two, um, this gives you a little bit of enhancement. And then these factors here basically knock you down. Um, they are not your, not your friend. Okay. Um, there's just another example of a neutron capture on iron, and you can see the resonance region. It's very, very dense here. Here I show this because the data is complete right up until where the resonances become so thick that you really, they really do form just a smooth continuum cross section at that point. Okay, let's actually now develop some intuition here. Um, so the this this is. Uh, imagine fuel, which is infinite in extent. So you see an edge of the screen here, but the fuel keeps on going. So let's walk through the life of a neutron. So here in the middle, you have a fissioning event that produces four neutrons, just to, um, you know, to give this some reality here. So here's one that scatters from a proton in the water, uh, actually does make it to a fuel rod, um, uh, but then is captured, gives rise to a gamma uh, play over. Okay, here's one that scatters, scatters, scatters. It moderates, captured on water again, gives rise to a gamma. It's um, out of play, game over. Okay, um, this one scatters from water, scatters from the fuel or the cladding, come, comes up, actually makes it into a fuel cell, causes a fission event, more neutrons. This one, you could say, what happened to it? Well. Um, it's okay because remember the edge of the page. This is a, this case is a, a case where you have a, an infinite um, uh, uh, a um, uh, and uh, there's no boundary to this uh, fuel element. It's it's infinite in, in extent. So it will then ultimately end up with one of two or three fates: uh, either be captured on the water, uh, cause a fission, or uh, might be captured and give rise to a gamma ray uh, in, in the fuel. Okay, now, same game, except the edge of your screen is the edge of the fuel. So now we're gonna go to the finite case. Same as before. <clears throat> the, um, so I have four neutrons created, but now a couple of other things can happen. Just as before, it can scatter, 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 and cause a fission ultimately, or it can scatter, get eaten up by the fuel, but not fission. Uh, here is a um, fast neutron, which actually makes it to the edge of the fuel assembly. It's gone. So you can actually lose. There's now going to be two additional loss terms. One is that fast neutrons promptly can get lost from the fuel assembly. The other is it'll scatter, 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 and a thermal neutron can also leave. So for a finite fuel assembly, you have what's called the six-factor for formula, augmented by um, two other things, which are going to be numbers less than one. So again, these are not your friend. Uh, the probability of the fast neutron does not escape from the assembly, but you try to design your reactor large enough that um, uh, the uh, that this number will be as close to one as possible. Ditto uh, for the slow neutron uh, uh, cross section uh, as well. For slow neutrons, um, you um, uh, there will be a uh, a uh, probability that they will not uh, escape uh, uh, the uh, uh, as well. And again, you want this number to be as close as possible to one. So let's just take a look at the life of a thousand neutrons. And uh, this is an example. Uh, I'm trying to remember where this came from here. A thousand neutrons uh, start off. A few of them um, 
will scatter from uh, the fissile component of the fuel, there'll be a small augmentation there. So in fact, you'll end up with 1,030 neutrons. Now, so in a finite fuel assembly, uh, in a finite size reactor, um, some of them will leak. Um, typical numbers will be uh, 0.9 or so. So the non-leakage, the ones that stay put uh, and continue to uh, degrade in energy is around 0.95. So if you lost 51 neutrons or so, now you're down to 979. Okay, now you have to uh, uh, make it through the resonance region as it continues to slow down. You're gonna pass through the region of these resonances here, uh, but 25% of them at that point are going to be lost. Um, and so you're gonna be down to 734 neutrons here. Once you're into the thermal region, you um, also, uh, you have the probability that some neutrons are going to be lost. Um, whoops. Back. Use my trackpad. <clears throat> um, so 96% will stay in the assembly, but 29 will be lost. Now, thermal utilization. Um, which of them get them get captured? Did I hear something? Okay. Um, the um, uh, what's called a thermal utilization, which of them are actually actually captured uh, onto the fuel. Um, again, you want that, you design a reactor to, to make that as large a number as possible. Um, and then, um, uh, so, and then the, the question is, what is the reproduction factor given you capture onto the fuel? Let me come on to the next slide. Um, I took this out of, I think this came out of- Carl, I, th I think we have a, we have a question, from, question from Michael. Michael, do you want to ask your question? Oh, no, yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could go over some of the physical controls that uh, reactors use to uh, control each of those uh, factors. Ah, let's see. Um, the okay, this is where I probably want to bring in Max Fratoni here. Uh, a lot of these things are you're not going to be able to control uh, real time. Um, if you have a, um, a, a boiling water reactor, and I guess, I think there's probably two dozen uh, uh, nuclear engineers here are more conversant than, than I am. You actually have, um, uh, some reactors actually have built in uh, feedbacks that keep you uh, 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 stable, such that if water boils, you have less thermalization and that tends to restore you uh, toward, uh, keep you away from runaway and so forth. As you build up poisons after weeks and months of operation. Um, you do have, by the way, you do have um, uh, control rods in your reactors um, there. Um, you can, uh, since the poisons themselves tend to take neutrons out of play, in general, you'll be withdrawing to keep to k equals to one. You, you, will, actually, uh, you will actually need to uh, withdraw the control rods like that. We'll get in in just a second. I just want to make one comment in a, in a second about stability of reactors. Um, but I am going to try to bring in Max Fratoni or one of the other people in my department if people are interested to get a deeper dive into uh, reactor physics, which this is not what we're supposed to be doing in this course. But thank you. That's a, that's a good question. Thank you. Let's see, where was I? Oh yeah, why was I here? Yeah, okay. Uh, what I want you to do is look at the following thing. Um, the third column here, it says 0.0253. Well, that's thermal. Uh, that's 1 40th an electron volt. That is a thermalized neutron energy. And just look at a couple of entries here. This is uranium 235. The fission cross-section, uh, so if, you, if a neutron uh, captures, uh, the fission cross-section is huge, not a thousand, but it's 585 barns. But um, you also, there's also uh, a close to 100 barn cross-section, 98.7 barn cross-section for a neutron to capture and gamma decay um, and not fission. So that's a neutron which is useless, taken out of play. 
And that's where you go from uh, the, the number that was like 2.7 down to a number that looks like 2.05 is because you've got the ratio of roughly 600 over 600 plus 100, 700. So 0.67 is about 85%. So one neutron in seven, even if it's captured by uh, the good stuff, doesn't help you. It does not lead to another fission event. That's here. See, so this is the reproduction factor. You see, this is a slightly smaller number than the, um, the number of neutrons uh, that you know and love of around two and a half of the number of neutrons that are produced if a fission happens. But if a neutron is captured by 235, uh, it doesn't always fission. Fission is about 85% of the time. The other times it does something um, uh, 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 useless, to, useless to the problem. Now, um, again, this is a problem that uh, I think in previous years we gave, which was to estimate how long it takes for the neutron to uh, thermalize. As I mentioned in water, it's about 25 scatterings will get you down there. Um, if you start from MEV, you can do a kind of a back of the envelope calculation and you're talking about um, uh, hundreds of milliseconds to, um, um, you know, uh, you know, as a generational time to go through this loop. Um, I'm not a nuclear engineer, but I, I the, the whole thing is, is, uh, is uh, fascinating. Um, Everything in life we take for granted uh, nowadays. We we entrust our lives to things which are um, under um, fast uh, feedback control. Jet airliners, tactical jets, lots and lots of things. Uh, we entrust our our life and safety to things which are are doing automated fast feedback uh, to keep in uh, stable uh, operation uh, operational conditions. Um, that's actually pretty fast. And so the answer is how do real reactors, uh, how are uh, uh, reactors able um, to be um, uh, safely and securely controlled? There is a, a little thing that you saw as a sidebar when I showed you the chart of the nucleides, when you saw that parabolic cross cut through the valley of stability, um, you, if you would look carefully, you would actually see that some of these um, species way up the, the, the valley on the, on the hills above the valley of stability, the difference in energy between the mother and the daughter is so large that you can get a beta decay above the neutron binding energy of the daughter and it will pop out a neutron. So you have the phenomenon of what's called beta delayed neutrons. Um, and it turns out they are what actually allows you to uh, sensibly control reactors because the beta decay time will be on the order of seconds to 20 seconds to minutes or something like that, um, which means to say you've got this glow, a very, a very small fraction of neutrons, which is coming out long after the fact, but of course contribute to, um, contribute to the overall um, criticality of the reactor. And it's because of the slow time associated with these beta decay neutrons, which allows the controls of reactors to be much slower than um, uh, the millisecond time scale. And this is something that Stan Prusen, uh, one of the venerable guys in our department, um, who died so several years ago, actually spent a good deal of his career uh, studying where um, you know, the, the, the science, uh, the, the physics of beta delayed neutrons and uh, their role in reactors. Okay, um, just for completeness, here's 238. And you can see um, when you get down to the, um, uh, the thermal regime uh, down here, um, the, it's negligible, it's, it's microbarns of cross section, totally one can ignore this completely, but um, it actually has a non-trivial cross-section for um, gobbling up neutrons, taking them out of play. And of course, in, a, in a typical reactors, this is, uh, in fact, it is the dominant component of the fuel. Okay, now let's, let's um, ask, uh, and we'll begin to look forward a little bit to the issue of, of um, 
super critical reactions. Um, what's important? Okay, again, we're gonna talk about the finite and extent problem. So what you see is, is what's on the screen. This is a finite element um, thing. Obviously, <clears throat> you see, when you think about the attenuation coefficient, um, there uh, E equals minus mu X uh, like that, um, you know, a larger fuel assembly is better, more opportunity for the neutron um, to do something productive. So total mass is important. What else is important? Interestingly, and this is where, again, we're beginning to uh, look forward to, to the issue of bombs. Um, density is important. Suppose I take this um, fuel and I now, uh, if, suppose I had the ability, of course materials are, tend to be very incompressible. Suppose I actually now squeeze, I actually compress uh, this fuel assembly a factor of two in linear dimension. And um, uh, suppose I have a relatively small assembly like this, um, and I'm now a neutron created right in the middle of the assembly. Um, how does the neutron escape probability change? Suppose actually it had a high probability of escaping in the first place, but now I squeeze in all three linear dimensions, I squeeze by a factor of two. How did it change? It's a little bit of a trick question. What was the question again? Suppose, suppose I have a, a small fuel assembly like this, um, such that the probability, if I'm a neutron and I'm created right in the middle and I have a high probability for leaving, so the probability for not leaving is, is small, but now I compress that matter by a factor of two in all dimensions. How, how high did the, uh, what happened to the density? Come on, that's easy. I, I compress the density it. Density increased. By? By how much? Uh, by a factor of four. A factor of eight. Oh, right. Three. The density went up a factor of eight, but what often people forget about is that you've actually also foreshortened the flight dimension. So in fact, the aerial density only goes up by the square, not the cube. But nevertheless, the important lesson is if I have now taken that matrix of that, that matter and I have, uh, if I have had the wherewithal to increase the density uh, like that, uh, I've dramatically increased the probability of intercepting the neutrons on the way out and, 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 having, and, and increasing the criticality of the reaction. So not only is mass important, but the density is important. What else is important? Shape is important. Um, if I take, uh, suppose I, ta I took the original um, situation, so I'm, I'm not squeezing, I'm not, I'm not compressing the matter, but I'm just rearranging the matter. Um, so I keep the same density, but instead of being uh, a ideally a sphere, but a cube is fine. Um, now I actually turn it into a long tube. Um, just intuitively, um, what happens to the probability, uh, the escape probability for a neutron? Escape probability goes up. Yeah, it, the escape probably goes up. It's all quote unquote. It's all skin, right? So you, in other words, it's you. The, if you if you're sitting there where that neutron is and you look in all directions, it's a it's a short path uh, to freedom. So in fact, shape is important. Um, if you want uh, the, the the things which improve criticality, um, are having compact shapes, ideally like a sphere, or uh, something like a cube, or something like that. Now, one more thing is important. Um, the name of the game, and you're, you're picking up the, the, the spirit of this thing, is keeping neutrons in play. It's a little bit like pinball, old-fashioned pinball machines from, you know, 
half a century or three quarters of a century ago. There's one more way of keeping neutrons in play. Put a reflector outside the fuel. Exactly, right. Um, sometimes uh, also what's called in the bomb business a tamper here. If I put up a material um, uh, here that uh, has a, uh, that can elastically scatter the neutron back into the region of interest, then the criticality uh, will go up like that. Um, so, uh, so uh, and uh, we'll explain these terms a little bit later on. So mass, density, shape, and neutron reflection are all um, important, uh, you know, for the issue of criticality. Okay, so there is it. Um, I think what we're going to do is hang it up for today. Um, and uh, we're going to do a little bit more to kind of put flesh on the bones uh, next time about the issue of um, um, uh, a little more aspect of physics that are going to be important if we deliberately want to create a supercritical assembly, i.e. a bomb. We'll, we'll talk about some of the physics that uh, is important that, uh, again, not to become experts in these things, but actually to be just cognizant of the kinds of problems that the people in the Manhattan Project and afterwards had to um, wrestle with um, in creating a um, successful and sort of economical, you know, a, a sort of minimal uh, supercritical assembly. So let me take questions. And if not, uh, we will be um, back on Monday. And Professor Nacht, what is our plan for Monday? Um, I'm not sure, Mansuk. What's the plan for Monday? Uh, Monday, uh, we'll begin with uh, Professor Nacht, then uh, we'll turn it over to Professor Spieber. Half an hour. We split this, we split the class from there. Okay. Right. Okay. Any further questions? If not, we'll see you on uh, Monday. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. Uh, Thank, you. You. Right. Thank you. Thank you.